a lot. Recon
Recording in progress. leadership to adhere to our protocols and base our decisions upon a, a reasoned assessment of all available information. We will advocate for each of our schools and support high quality public education in Lemson. With that, we'll open up public comment. Do we have anybody who signed up? There's one person, she's just logging on now. Uh, is there any while we're waiting for her? Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak? Yes, I would actually. Okay. Can you, can you state your name and address? Um, Nikki Turpin, Jocelyn Street in Lemonster. Go ahead, thank you. So I'm speaking this afternoon once again about what seems to be a real lack of understanding of the needs of students, especially students of color, which are a large portion of our student body in Lemonster Public Schools. First being LEAP, um, which is this idea that we need to extend an educational gap for students, especially right now when most students are post COVID. And as many teachers know, there's no catch up anymore. This idea of students being far behind or needing to catch up is completely obtuse because students, this is the new normal. Us as educators know that this is the new normal. We are not about catching up to their peers, but more so making sure that their mental and social emotional learning is adequate so that they can survive what they're about to experience being in a post COVID world. This whole idea of being standardized and understanding is just another example of white supremacy sitting in spaces of education. There is no perfection. There is no need to catch up when in fact our students are screaming consistently that they are anxious, that they need help, that they want to understand why they're having the feelings that they're having and we are ignoring it as educators and as parents. This all ties back to having people sitting on our school committee right now who, could, who completely engage in anti-race and in, in not and are not engaging in anti-racist work. So about five months ago, I offered to, for free of charge, um, help work with the school committee in working and understanding DEI because as of right now, I believe the Silmanshire School District does not have a DEI initiative or um, co coordinator to help address all of the issues that honestly, one person cannot do in, in Lemonster Public School District. That was met with silence. No one spoke up to want to engage in that type of work, or many few did, and it wasn't brought to the board again to actually be shared out. So as we're sitting here discussing LEAP and all these other programs, it's also really important for us to know that there are people sitting on the school committee who agree with the idea of arming teachers in classrooms, an, an initiative that will completely affect students of color because students of color are consistently seen as threats. We did, five, five years ago, a student was shot by a white teacher. And when this was brought up in a conversation on Facebook, Greg Thomas said, please don't make this racist. I'm sorry, how is it not racist? And if you don't see that it's racist, maybe sharing the idea that you don't understand anti-racist work and sitting on a school committee means that you are not ready to have this amount of power. Mediocre is no longer allowed. We need you to do your job. Three, two minutes are up. Do we have anybody else in the um or do we have the person that signed up? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Do we have anybody in the audience that would like to speak? Do we have anybody online that would like to speak? One more time, uh, second time. Is there anybody else in the audience or online that would like to speak? Last, is there anybody in the audience or online that would like to provide public comment? All right. Uh, with that, we will move on to, yeah, I'm sorry. We, 
that that would close public comment. Uh, Superintendent communications. There are no communications this evening. Superintendent report. Sure. Um, tonight, I'm going to be sharing this with Jim Riley. It's a little difficult being here and not there. Um, before I get started, I just I want to thank everyone and the school committee for showing up Saturday to an incredible graduation. Between the three schools, we graduated almost 470 students, each one of them receiving their diplomas, something that they've earned and worked for for so many years. We've been celebrating students for weeks and we actually are going to continue to do that over the next coming days. And besides all the transitions and field trips and field days, we have a lot of traditions. And tonight I'd like to start a new one. And this is something that a teacher in Lemonster asked me to do two years ago, but COVID happened. Um, so we're putting it in place tonight. It's time to celebrate our retirees. These, these are members, our educators who work with our students and have been with us for decades. We always welcome in our, our newest and youngest teacher and we congratulate them after three years of, of meeting a, an expectation of be, becoming a Lemons to Public School teacher. But then in the end, after, you know, some people put in over 30 years, we say, oh, good luck to you and that's it. Tonight's about them. And I'd really like to uh, say thank you. If nothing else, thank you for giving us your time, your energy, your craft and your skill. Uh, you've helped thousands upon thousands of children in Lemonster. And so this evening, I'm, I'm going to ask Mr. Riley to take over and introduce you to our retirees and give, a, give out a heartfelt thank you from all of us. So, Mr. Riley. Thank you very much, Superintendent Deacon. Um, while our individual schools have always taken great pride and care in recognizing those among them who are retiring, we have missed an opportunity to do so at the district level. So when we were contacted by Janet Lee, a teacher at Free Street, who suggested that we take time to honor those who have dedicated their careers to making a difference to the lives of our students and families here in Lemonster, we thought, what a great idea to let those who have made education their vocation in the city of Lemonster, to show them how much we respect and appreciate their talent, commitment, and hard work. So I now have the distinct honor to read the names of our retiring educators and I would invite any of those who are present to please come and be recognized by receiving a t-shirt um, and walking around the outside of this table so we can shake your hand and thank you for your service in person. So our first recognition is for Rebecca Harpinito. Rebecca was hired in August of 1997 and she'll be retiring this October. She's been a special education teacher at the Northwest School. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Next up is Deborah Caudell. Deborah was hired in August of 2011, and she'll be retiring this June. She's a library and media specialist at Fall Park. You will be missed, Deb. You'll all be missed too. No. <laughs> Thank we'll you so you. much. Next up is Lori Ford. Lori was hired in September of 1990. <coughs> She'll be retiring this September, and she's been a math teacher at the Lemonster High School. Where did 32 years go, Lori? Best of luck. Deborah Brady joined us in August of 2005. She will be retiring this June and she's been a history teacher at Lemonster High School. Great job.
Maureen <clears throat> Lambert joined the district in August of 2001. She'll be retiring this June as a grade five teacher at Johnny Appleson. Thanks, Noni. <laughs> Robert Landry was hired by the district in August of 1999. He'll be retiring this June and he has been a long-term, long-time music teacher at Sam Set Middle School. Deborah Marshan was hired in August of 1997, and she'll be retiring this June as an English teacher at the Samoset Middle School. Go, Deb, go! <laughs> Congratulations. We'll miss you, Deb. Mary Kate McNamara was hired in August of 1992. She'll be retiring this June as a longtime kindergarten teacher at Johnny Appleseed. Thirty years with little ones. Oh my, Mary Kate. Linda Snow was hired in October of 1996. She'll be retiring this June as a grade three teacher at Fallbrook Elementary. So happy for you, Linda. Colleen Stillman was hired in August of 2005. She's gonna be retiring this June. She's a math STEM teacher at Fallbrook. Keep doing your math, Colleen. Kimberly Woodford was hired most recently in July of 2019, and now will be retiring this June as the SPED director, our special education director, and the pupil personnel um, for the London School District. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, Kim. Deborah Andrews was hired in November of 2003. She's going to be retiring this August of 2022. Has been a tutor at CTEI. Congratulations. Thank you, Deb. Janice Kenyon was hired in December of 1999, and she'll be um, retiring this June, a long-term preschool educator at the Bennett School. Saw both my kids through, so thank you, Janice. Thank you. <laughs> uh, way to go, Janice. <laughs> Michelle Tagama was hired in January of 2001 and will be retiring this June as a longtime paraprofessional support person at Johnny Appleseed. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and for everyone that is in the room tonight, thank you for coming out on a Monday night. I know it's a beautiful night, um, but 
really, this is about you. And we are so grateful. We're so grateful that we're going to take a break right now and give everybody um, a quick pastry break. So congratulations again to all our retirees. We love you. We'll miss you. I have a funny feeling we'll be calling you. So do not change your phone number. And God bless and congratulations to all of you. you it's well-deserved. Recording stopped.
Steve, are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Now we are. Okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't even hear them introduce you. Um, Mrs. Laura Van Doren. She is the selected candidate for the Director of Special Education and Pupil Services. She comes with a wealth of background, as you've seen in her resume. She has all the characteristics of what could be a phenomenal administrator and beyond. I feel blessed that she is staying with Lemonster and taking on this new challenge. It suits her, her skill set, her personality, and the next steps in her career path. So I want to present the candidate for Director of SPED Services, Mrs. Laura Van Doren. So how we're going to start this off is we're just going to go around the table and ask a few different uh, questions and give you the opportunity to answer. Um, so uh, Melissa, do you want to or should we start with Brandon? Brandon, you want to? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Uh, hi, Laura. Sorry I'm at home, but glad to see you here. Uh, please share why you've decided to apply to the Lemonster School District for this position. In the interest of not keeping everyone here for anything <laughs> other than absolutely necessary. Um, honestly, I'm just very passionate about helping to continue all the good work that's been happening in Lemonster and moving us forward. Um, oddly enough, Kimberly Woodford hired me back in 2008, so it's really fitting um, for me to be able to follow up the work she's been doing. I think that we have such a unique community and opportunities to build the excellence and equity that we've already been laying the groundwork for, um, that I'm excited to move that forward and to help the students of Lemonster to show all that they have to offer the community. Melissa, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, please tell us about a successful program in your current district and elaborate on what the program, how the program has been instrumental to positive outcomes. Uh, I do think the one where I've been able to see the most positive impact for our students is the full inclusion program, most specifically when I look at our ABA population. And I say that because we've been able to keep more and more ABA students in district accessing their local school and their community because we have these services and supports in place. And from my current seat at the high school, I do see the data points we have, like the biology MCAS, our students who are in that full inclusion setting do better on that test. They have access to that high quality curriculum and when we're able to take those special education supports and move them into that setting we see more growth from our students we see them able to achieve at those high levels that as i mentioned i know that they're capable of and i want to keep moving them forward in uh, and again i could go on and on forever but we're all in love so i'm going to try and control myself <laughs> the next question. Um, if you were able to change or implement a new program in your current district, what would that program be and why? So again, I think my, my goal in this first year is to continue the good work we've been doing. Um, Kim Woodford has brought in some great consultants to look at our SSC program and some work we can do there, uh, working with our related service providers. So that is all work I want to continue. And then I would really want to make a more informed decision about what would be best for our district in the coming years. I do have some ideas that I personally think are really cool, but don't yet have all of that information. Um, things like expanding our 18 to 22 specialized programming, partnering with the Massachusetts Concurrent Enrollment Initiative. Um, that I mentioned this when I met with some of the committee members previously. There's no one in Worcester County that's currently a part of that initiative, and yet it is a statewide initiative. So I'd love to get some more information around that. Um, I think partnering with Kathy Gaudette and looking at some bright and bridge programming to help with the mental health concerns that we have in the district and getting our students back into our schools in a place where they're ready to learn um, are all things that I'd be very interested in continuing to think about. 
Josh. Uh, Lemon Sister serves a diverse special needs population. Please describe the commitment to implementing and supporting the education of students in the least restrictive environment. Well, Josh, <laughs> uh, it's honestly, aside from the fact that it is something we need to provide as a school district and that we're regulated to do so, I am incredibly passionate about not only that full inclusion program, but when that's not something our students can access, how can we provide them that free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment? It's not always going to be full inclusion. However, we have opportunities to get our students interacting with their peers, with their neurotypical peers, same age peers, whatever it needs to look like so that they can get the same high quality content curriculum and social experiences that help them to develop. So, hello. So, how can you address, uh, best address and support the social emotional needs of all of our students? Big question right now. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, we were concerned about mental health and social emotional needs pre COVID and then coming back from the pandemic and a lot of conversations that have been had in this group. I think really we need to look at using the resources we currently have with our counselors, our school adjustment counselors, our BCBAs, our school psychologists, and how can we use the staff and resources we already have to create systems that help preempt some of these bigger concerns. And maybe it's bringing in screeners so that we can find the kids that maybe aren't externalizing as much as internalizing. I think we have some opportunities there, but we also have the resources in district to take advantage of those opportunities. And it is an important topic for us right now. Mr. Hool. Hi, Laura. Uh, question I have for you here is, please share with us your approach to working with parents and guardians, staff and students. So my current role, this is, all day, every day for me. Um, the biggest thing I can say is having that open communication and being available as much as possible. And honestly, just being transparent and that, okay, I, I'm not available right now, but that doesn't mean I don't wanna hear from you. Uh, in this particular role that I'm interviewing for, I would wanna get into every school. I'd wanna see programs and meet staff and students so that I can, again, have that information that will help me make decisions that are best for our district, uh, but really just being as available as possible. And, you know, I don't have anything to hide. I've always said to my staff, you may not agree with every decision I make, but you're always going to know that my number one priority is doing what's best for our students. And I would continue that. Thank you. <laughs> How do you keep apprised of the most recent changes, updates of all local, state, and federal policies? I'm, I'm chuckling because I mentioned in my previous interview, I don't sleep a lot. And so sometimes at 2 a.m. when I'm not sleeping, I'm on the internet seeing what Desi posted. Um, and that's just a fun fact about me. In all honesty, I belong to a number of professional organizations that share that information readily. Uh, I'm already in contact with our attorney, who's great about running trainings. Uh, on Thursday, I'm scheduled to attend a conference with the statewide administrators of special education, where we do get a legal briefing. Uh, and beyond that, Desi is always sharing information. So feel feel pretty well versed in the updates. Excellent. I guess we'll go back around again. Uh, Oh, Brandon, I was forgetting who was up Brandon, do you want to go again? Sure. How do you ensure that the most recent information is disseminated effectively to your staff? So one huge thing is I know I have a great team of coordinators. Uh, so they are a huge resource in getting the information to the schools. I'm a big fan of not overwhelming people and making sure that the right people have the right information. Um, so it would be a matter of having clear communication oftentimes with those coordinators to what needs to be shared at the building level. Um, 
and you know, depending on what the information is, would really dictate how that needs to be disseminated. So if something could be an email, great. If something is so important that we need to hold some professional development or training around it, then that's the level that it's at. But again, that open communication and transparency. How would you evaluate the effectiveness of staff and programs in the district? So there's a couple of things that are coming to mind. One would be looking at the programs we currently have and much like I mentioned, Kim Whitaker has already started doing, running some audits of them. And it doesn't have to be every program every year, but just keeping our eyes on how each program's doing, kind of pick and choose what's gonna be the most important thing at any given time. Um, and then with that, developing some entrance and exit criteria and having, you know, it's not hard and fast and we do individualize because that's the name of the game. Uh, but okay, this is what we should be looking at for these programs. And then what are the data points we're gonna use to ensure that we're meeting those criteria and getting the staff on board with it. We're not gonna have effective programming if the staff isn't completely bought in and sharing that vision of what we're working for. Uh, what is your experience developing a program budget? So in all honesty, not much. Um, I had a small budget at the high school that Dr. Jatsinski lets me play with, but it's pretty much spent <laughs> every year just refilling some materials. That being said, um, poor Kim, I, didn't, I don't think she knew I was going to mention her name so many times this evening. <laughs> she has been an excellent mentor, and she has given me um, the authority to allocate resources and act judiciously and in a financially responsible manner so that we can run what we need to run at the high school and help our students to continue moving forward. Um, so well, it's probably one of the things that I'm going to be uh, seeking out the business office and the rest of the cabinet to support me with. I'm also very comfortable in doing that work. Josh? What is your thought process when you're developing such a budget? And what is your number one priority in this process? Number one priority is getting excellent equitable services to our students. That one's a pretty easy answer. Uh, as far as the process goes, it's going to be aligning with the district strategic plan, making sure that we have, again, the right people in the right places, uh, because the biggest chunk of the money is going to be on our staffing and our people. So if that's where all the money's being spent, I want to make sure that they're doing their job and have what they need to do so. But it's really going to be working with that business office and the rest of the cabinet to make sure that my department's in alignment and that we're spending that money in the best way possible for our students. Yeah, that's a favorite the last question. But how has a special education changed during the current pandemic? And what do you think are the most crucial issues to address moving forward? Even statewide, I venture nationwide, but I don't actually have that information. We're seeing an increase in the number of referrals. Uh, I think the students being home with their parents did uh, lead to, you know, different eyes on things and some concerns that we want to make sure we're addressing, not only through special education, but through proper interventions in the general education setting but really the mental health needs that are coming through right now would be probably the biggest thing that I could highlight. Um, and then what was the second part? Uh, kind of answered it. And what do you think are the most crucial issues we're addressing moving forward? So I would say the most crucial would be the mental health issues if I had to underscore something. Yep. Thank you. All right, does anybody have any follow-up questions they'd like to ask? Just have one question. Um, so, you know, um, from year to year, the needs of staffing can change, uh, especially in special education, as far as what, what you know, one to ones and things like that. Uh, so, how do you um, train your staff, um, get them prepared for for the potential shifting of needs of the students and so forth? So that kind of goes back to that training piece I was talking about. One of the best things we can do is build the capacity of our staff to address these different needs that may arise. 
we have some opportunities where we can project who's going to age out, um, kind of protect some of that tuition money that's going to the out of district placements. And we never know who's going to move in. We never know where some of that's going to go. But we can do our best to say, okay, here's the staff we have. Here's their skill set. We want them matched up with the students who need them most. And so that may mean working with the coordinators to say, okay, you have this staff, they have this skill set. We have a kiddo, a student who needs that help. How can we make that match? And it's really about being creative. I'm not going to say I'm never going to come to this table and <laughs> beg for another staff member because I don't know what's going to happen. I can't predict the future, but I think we can be smart about it uh, and look at who's aging out from the high school program, who's coming into our early childhood, use that information to our advantage. Open it up to discussion. I do have one follow-up question. It's the devil in you. What worries you the most? Believing that you're succeeding when in reality you're failing or failing and not realizing you're really succeeding. What stopgap measures can you put in place like God really? We always wanna make progress, but we also need to be realistic about where we are making progress. And I think the stopgaps would be around that progress monitoring and doing those audits and saying, okay, are we meeting the benchmarks that we wanted to meet or are we way off base? Because if we went a whole year without doing that work and checking where we are, we may discover that we thought we were doing great, but we're, we're not. Or, oh my gosh, we thought we were awful. We're really doing fantastic. And we didn't make the adjustments. So maybe there was staff that we could have used somewhere else because we didn't, we didn't check for that. Um, so I think it's that progress monitoring and to making sure that we are checking those things periodically rather than waiting a whole year. Thanks. I just have just have a question. So uh, modern technology, I was at your multicast. So bring your whole thing. I'm all interviews seem good to us, I think. I can speak collectively. What I'm most interested in is everything that you said tonight. Can you sort of transcribe it into something? Because tonight we need to tell us what you're going to do, the kinds of things that you have thoughts, and then later we kind of lose track of all that. So almost like an entry point saying, this is what you can expect from me, right? And then, and, and that helps us to support you as well. Um, I find that on the city side, we're doing the same, I've been doing the same thing for years. All interviews are good, they are. And it's very impressive, excellent. But um, sometimes, and I'm not suggesting this, sometimes a year later, I stop and wonder when that plan takes into place. So just to keep us all in sync, um, it, it would be very helpful just to, you know, here's what I plan on. This is what you can expect from me, here are my goals. And then occasionally just let us know how you're going with it. And that doesn't mean that when you start a position that you know the goals aren't like this, that's perfectly okay. No. And then later find out they can only do this much. That's completely understandable, but at least it gives us an idea of what's up with it. So I heard on the way in all the things that you talked about that you'd like to do, and you know, being members, if you members of multiple um, you know organizations, and it's I'm, I'm all for it. So, so good job. Thank you. Thank you. I would just ask if you could give me some time to oh, get no, that together. No, no, We're trying no. to wrap things up at no, high school right now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, whatever is good. Just, well, I'm need to it, <laughs> it, you'll find it'll just help you to get your thoughts and do something. And, you know, every once in a while, go out, look at it again, and make sure you're, you know, not close. Okay. I think. Before you make a motion, I just want to let the committee know that committee member Renchowski has joined the meeting. Okay. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to um, appoint hire Lauren Van Dorn as the um, director of, I'm going to say it right here, um, pupil personnel service director. I'd like to second the motion. Okay. The motion is second. You see your thing. You see your thing. <laughs> you started it, you finish it. All right. All those in favor? 
we need to do a verbal vote. Yeah. Since yeah, Greg and Greg, yes. And Greg? Yes. Uh, Greg? You got it. Yeah. Yes. Good job. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And good luck. And let us you. you know, the school committee controls the budget. And if there are things that, right, we have these opera funds that everybody has and talks about. If there are things that we can do to help you, we need to know this. We're not, you know, we're not in school day to day. It's the superintendent, but, you know, but through the superintendent, by all means, let us know whatever that is whatever that is because you know my job now is to help kids catch up and take care of the needs and that's exactly what the, the funds are for so three years from now doesn't help you but so if you need money now we need funds to do things now then we need to come back and use it all right so get some rest <laughs> okay we're now going to move on to the superintendent's evaluation so, Eileen. Sure. so uh, the superintendent has given us um sort of a synopsis of um, this past year, the things that she's accomplished, things that we still need to, you know, move forward on. Um, we have the evaluation tool that we've been using over the last, um, well, several years in any case. I don't know exactly how many, but at least three or four. Um, and, you know, uh, Sal, Lewis, and I have met briefly. And given our tight um, time frame, uh, because we really do need to turn this around to Paula um, very shortly. Uh, we decided that we're going to stick with this uh, measuring tool and we will um, then take a look at it um, for next year mm -hmm. um, to you know, see what needs to be tweaked. Um, and we're hoping that folks can get this back to us in a two week turnaround time um, so that we can the evaluation and present it to the superintendent. Okay. And then we'll set new goals. I think we want to set new goals for ourselves, even though it's maybe yet. There's nothing wrong with that. We have the summer. And then set our, our it's goals. Really end of the year. Well, end of the year, new year coming, right? New year coming. No, but normally we do it in January or so, but we have a new, you know, a new team and we'll, we'll you know, base those goals. And then we've got the perfect time because we present it to superintendent's evaluation. So we have common, common, common goals, right? And then, I think that's the easiest way to move forward. Does that sound good, everybody? Thank you, Eileen, for doing that. Thank you, everybody on the committee. And so, how do we proceed? We have so, this. if everybody could email me their um, evaluation using this form, mm -hmm. um, and then I will uh, disseminate it to the committee. We already have set up to. Okay. Is that all right with everyone? Is that okay? Just one question about the. So the student learning goal two, there's a, a metric goal, and I'm not sure whether we met that goal or not. Let me just read it so anybody that's watching can or, or see. The, uh, the student learning goal one or two, I'm not sure. So 50% of the EL students will, yes, this is number one, will meet their yearly progress target as determined by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education as part of the Massachusetts goal of language proficiency within six years of strategic instruction. Then there are benchmarks. Student learning two, uh, the percent of bumps to students grades K through three, demonstrating grade level reading, fluency and comprehension, comprehension will uh, increase by 10% as measured by the dynamic indicators of the basic early literacy skills, also known as tables. And then there's some benchmarks. Right. So my, my question is, do we how do we grade somebody on it if we don't know the whole thing? I have in my response there is a measurement in there. Right. So go through this. If you need more time, you know, fine. Um I don't know, you know, as I discussed with the superintendent, if we need further meetings during the summer or whatever, fine. I don't want to have meetings just for the sake of the meetings unless you want to. Unless there's some other things, training or whatever that you'd like to do, it's a good time to do it. And you don't have to necessarily be on Monday nights. Days. I know we'll set a couple of ish areas that you want to cover the training. So maybe we can take those up. And we don't necessarily have to do it here. Um, plenty of places in town where you can go and go to Shoreland Farms and watch the Apple Trails. So if, if there are things that will be on the agenda, then we'll put them up. In the meantime, this will be our point. 
Lorraine Sapola, could you please come to the table? Also known as LEAP. Lauren Sapola also said that. LEAP 2.0. Academically advanced program. Correct. <laughs> Good evening, hey. everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you for, for having me here to just go through some of the uh, modifications that we are looking to put in place, a little bit of the history. We've had a, a program for uh, academically advanced students for quite a number of years now in grades three through grade eight uh, at the high school. We then certainly offer a variety of honors and then AP level coursework and dual enrollment. So we do feel that we have the entire spectrum covered for our students who are academically advanced. When we um, started down the, the COVID route and whether we were going to be hybrid or remote or a combination of them, uh, we did come to the table to say that we were going to be keeping all of our students in their neighborhood schools. And we did ask the classroom teachers to do their very best to continue with di the differentiation that they currently do in order to uh, meet the needs of our students who might need additional support, but also the, the needs of the students who need to be lifted up or pushed up. So we're constantly doing that in our classrooms. We're pulling students up and we're pushing students up. Along the way, I have had the, the pleasure of working with um, the, the parents, the teachers, the students, and our administrators gathering information. We've made tweaks along the way. One of the things that we did do recently was to make sure that we were offering our programming at the middle school at both middle schools instead of just at one. So the same programming now exists at both of those schools. I want to thank the elementary um, principals for coming out tonight. So Andres and Deb and Jeff and Patty are here. Um, they're a, a big part of the success of this programming that takes place in the schools. And they've provided us with some feedback as well. So we gave you a, a little bit of that. Um, we've, all of us, um, I would say mostly the administrators in the buildings have heard from parents about how difficult a decision it is to have our students actually leave their neighborhood school, leave their um, neighborhood friends or their classroom friends to go to a different building. Um, they've had relationships in kindergarten through second grade at the time or through third grade. So those have been difficult decisions the administrators have helped with. The transportation that we did as a district um, decide that we were going, the transportation was not going to get in the way of a student being able to access this program. But that did mean that students would be transported to their local, um, to their neighborhood school, and then take a shuttle to uh, Francis Drake, uh, it was Southeast when we first started the program. So that did mean some long um, bus trips for students and then going home in the afternoon. Those were other concerns that we heard at the district level, as well as our administrators. We heard from parents about isolating these students in a small cohort that traveled together for third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade and on. And one of the other pieces that we did here was having to make a decision in the middle of second grade, so with students who are seven years old, um, was a very difficult and a very young age for, these, for the parents to be having to make that decision. So we took all of this together and because we are looking to see, all right, we had a little break, we had issues with um, the virus and the program we had because of that, what could we do to offer this kind of a program at, the neighbor, at each of our neighborhood schools and for a larger audience of students. And what we have um, 
the program that we are putting forward to our families for the coming school year is that we will be offering this in grades four and five at each of the schools. So all four schools will have this program. They will not have to make a decision to leave their school. We will be delivering this through our specialty block. So students will be offered the opportunity to attend this LEAP programming with a teacher for up to four times per week and 40 minutes of walk. And that will take, um, they would go to that programming and in, in place of the, the STEM, the media and art and music, if they chose to. The, uh, we're, we're hoping to have this program develop uh, based on the wonders, which is our elementary curriculum. So it will follow along with the themes that all of the students have, but then these students will receive specialized instruction. And the idea is to, to use a novel study approach. So there are novels that are recommended to go with the themes with wonders. These students will be, um, we will choose these novels based on those themes, but not necessarily at the grade level. So the novels will be at the reading level that would be appropriate for our academic and advanced students. And the teacher would be creating programming that would interweave uh, math, science, art, and music within that project-based novel study. So this is an opportunity for our students to receive a, a variety of skills and supports, uh, but again, meet, hopefully meeting these concerns or questions that we've had from our parents. We've um, worked with the building level administrators. Of course, when we talk about doing this, they take a minute to ask a few questions and then they jump right in and they, they discuss some of the things that they would need to do as far as scheduling and the sharing of teachers. Um, the district will be supporting this program with two full-time physician teachers and they will be shared at the school. So two of the schools will partner up and they will have uh, one, one teacher, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and they would be given travel time certainly between the two schools. And because we are doing this in um, doing the specialist block, that will free up some classroom space. Um, for example, if fourth grade goes to their specials all at the same time, the classrooms that the those students would have been in will be available for this teacher to be able to use. And then the classroom teacher who will be allowing that class to be used. We'll get to see what's going on with those students. We'll get to share in that, that work and maybe think about bringing that, some of that back to um, the general education classrooms. So this is, uh, we do feel that this is a modification that we're making that will really benefit all students. Um, we had gotten to a place where we had approximately maybe a classroom more like about 15 students per grade level when we were at Fallbrook this is going to allow us to have um, 20 students at grade four and grade five in each of the schools so that means that we're going to have 40 students at each school that will get this academically advanced instruction while at the same time spending time during the school day with their peers uh, which is important obviously for the students we will be using a, a screener. I've been working with um, our current pupil personnel director and our future per, uh, pupil mm -hmm. personnel director, uh, looking at uh, two of the screeners, one that we've used in the past and one that, uh, that is new to me. But uh, as I said, my pupil personnel friends are giving me information about that. And we are certainly looking for something that would have little or no bias as far as gender, race, and ethnicity. We want to make sure that all of the students that are in Lemonster have the opportunity for this and it wouldn't, there wouldn't be any bias involved. So I've got, done a lot of talking. I'm sure that there are some questions. So what, what, what's the comparison? So how much, it's 40 minutes. How was LEAP run before? Uh, we had a, a program where the students um, were transported to uh, Francis Drake School and they were in a classroom together. Um, All day. Yeah. So it's not the same program. It's a modification. You're right. It's a modification. 
It's 40 minutes four times a week. So that's one of the things that we are planning, uh, and this was something that our classroom teachers have asked of us, is more professional development for them on how they can differentiate for our um, academically advanced students in their own classroom. These teachers love having all of their students and want to make sure that they have that ability. So as part of our reset for Wonders next year, that is on the agenda for professional development for all staff. So I, I'm just afraid the, the leap is like one of the most popular, based on just what I hear, I don't solicit uh, any efforts. People say, you know, leap program, it sounds like one of the things that one is known for is the leap program, and I hate to get rid of it because it's one of the things that people are really supportive of. And, and, and I don't know, do we, do we survey these parents and we have something that comes back that says, yeah, we prefer these kids to be at home versus in the homeschool rather than at another school? Is it? I've heard this loud and clear for over 10 years, yes. In fact, the last, um, for the last three years before we had the pandemic, we, did, we were not able to fill a whole class. Parents wanted to stay in the neighborhood schools. I've, I've never heard, I've never once heard that complaint, but um, like I said, I don't solicit well, it. And it's not a complaint, it's yeah. they chose not to send their children. So they chose to have their children stay, even if they had an invitation, they chose not to accept that invitation, many of them. We did still have a few that did, but many, when they were asked why they chose not to accept the invitation, they were happy with the programming in their school, they were happy with the, the education that their students were receiving, and they really enjoyed the culture and climate in their neighborhood school. So and we already know what students will be encouraged to participate in the program? We're going to assess them um, using these screeners, mm -hmm. And we will be doing that as soon as we come back in the fall. So can we ask them, just so we have some feedback from them, probably the survey to say, so that way we have, we, we know, I mean, I, I, I know, if, you know, I get a hundred calls about, you know, the rail trip, sometimes in the weekend. So, but I, I can't measure that based on everything. So I, I just, I think it's any way that we can get that. That way we have something to say, you know, People would prefer to stay back. I, I trust what you're saying. Yes. You have a good pulse on it, but I just like something that, you know, the superintendent send, it sends out two messages a week. I, I, I don't have a problem with adding something that says, would you prefer, you know, A, would you like to participate? Two, if you could participate, would you want to be in your home school or would you rather be, you know, run the program like it was before? Then I think we have something to. And I have some that we can just check. It's not that certain. It's a, the worst thing in the world for a kid to come across town and meet new people and, and you know, and, and really excel. But if you maybe could replicate that and actually get more kids, I'm all for it. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, first, I was going to say I appreciate the first bullet points on the on the feedback from parents and the districts, uh, two different schools, rather. Um, as a parent or a family that involved in me, I share all of those sort of concerns, every single one of them. Um, having our son leave Northwest to go to another school, sometimes on the bus by itself, didn't really sit well with us in, in a lot of ways. And um, in, in everything you spoke of, I, I completely support because we experienced all that, right? The, the isolation from the kids that he was growing up with and, and, and so be it. So I hear you there and I support that 100%. My question is, what are some bullet points that we might use to kind of sell this to families? Because like you may have suggested, this goes from a full-time program to a four-time a week program in like one block. So what are some ways that we're gonna kind of tell these families that this is going to enhance your child's education, but maintain kind of their social relationships and, and their whole schooling experience? Just, I don't know what we have uh, to get already. Well, the, the idea, the, the project-based learning, which we're going to, we will be having a, a brand new teacher or a, a teacher new to this position. Uh, I'm sure that this position is going to be coveted by um, teachers that we, we already have in our, our system, uh, that they will have the opportunity to create a project-based environment and immerse students within that. That does take a lot of time and planning for, by teachers. 
And while they do their very best to do a lot of project-based learning, uh, that, as I said, takes a lot of their time. So that will be one, I believe, um, point families will see. And this is gonna be a little bit of a change, but our, our plan certainly is, um, as mentioned by the principals, to showcase this work and to provide opportunities for the students' work to maybe, maybe in this forum or other forums and on our website so that families who are thinking about doing it in the future will see, yes, these are um, academically advanced students and they're involved in some very enriching programming. So the project-based learning is exciting for all of us. Questions? So I just, um, back before we, um, in uh, my case, we're in grammar school, um, they did have cool apps that was called the Build It Tells program and they pulled those out. So this sounds, you know, sort of very similar to um, sort of things the prior to the program. Um, but my question is, if they're getting pulled out um, for 40 minutes, four times a week, um, and I understand there's going to be like a novel that's sort of following the curriculum, when they're back in their regular class and still working through the curriculum, is it redundancy? Or are they still learning and moving forward as opposed to revisiting things? Do you know what I mean? Sure, I understand that. The, and the thematic approach that Wonders has is actually more materials, more Wonders curriculum materials than any one teacher could use in their year. Um, so there are some places where they select or choose. And we would not be having the, um, these students interacting with the wonders materials, but would be using the theme. So if the theme was our community, which is a theme for second grade, I believe, um, then this, there would be a novel, most likely the novel would be at a middle school level as far as the Lex style level. Um, and it would have the same theme and the project would be that theme, but it would not, um, it would not supplant the, the materials that they were doing in the wonders class. I would want to make sure that they're quite right. stimulated and growing and not, you know, sort of. Being sure. <clears throat> That's one of the, the, the things that our teachers had mentioned. This is only going into the second year of using this new curriculum product, and they still need professional development and how to differentiate using all of these materials. And so, good communication between the two teaching cohorts so that they're not duplicating or stepping on each other's toes. Oh. No. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm hearing that art and music that they're going to sort of be missing the block forward that some of those needs are going to be addressed for mm -hmm. this couple of time. Uh, my concern is historically at times um, our special ed population has missed out on some of these blocks because those have often coincided with the same time that they need their PT or their OT or their speech. So how are we making sure that these kids who may qualify for this program aren't missing an option because of another form for special ed? I, I can't guarantee that that might not happen, but I mean, we brought that up. Um, our um, special education people personnel are very much about uh, our special education students and also our L students being involved in all opportunities. Uh, so we would definitely make sure that wherever possible that could take place. And I do believe um, I can ask um, Kim and, and Laura to, to let me know, but I, I wherever possible those uh, our, all of our students get to go to their specials um so i'm hoping that uh that that will will certainly be able to continue but we'll certainly make a note of that as well uh, and the as it stands right now in our schools um, band and chorus are not during special so if these um, students were take um, were interested in band and chorus they would still get that aspect of their music education Okay, thank you, Melissa. Anyone else? Yeah. Me. Go ahead. I just made it wrong. One of the dilemma that I have. The academically advanced advantages. What happens after the grade and the 
you know, you said they go to what grade? They go through eighth grade. Okay, and after the eighth grade, what happens? So when they get to uh, the campus here, they have the opportunity to either be um, in honors level classes, um, they have electives that are at the honors level, or, or they have vocational classes. And then when they get into 10th grade and up, they have the opportunity for advanced placement and for dual enrollment. So there are a variety of opportunities here, as well as LCE, which is a big picture learning school. So they, they have options provided to them on this campus for their high school experience. The other one that I have is, you know, you were saying that the wonders uh, themes, the kids and the teachers would be the wonders. My fear, you have the kid reading the themes. Just you gave examples of whatever theme with the number out of the hat. And if the kid is academically advantageous, even if even if the kid is not academically advantageous, okay, he's reading the theme, and then all of a sudden he asks himself or herself. That's like me. Or what am I doing? Is am I one of those characters in the theme? How do you deal with that? What's what's your answer? What's your well? We hope please. we hope that happens. Um, we we hope that our students can see themselves in the curriculum products and in the reading and in the work that they're doing. We hope they can say, this is me, or this is what I want to be. So that's a good problem to have, Ronnie. Um, they definitely, that, that's where we're hoping we're gonna catch these kids and we're gonna help them to grow by snagging their attention on some of the curriculum themes or units of study that they're, they're doing. So that's a good problem to have. We hope it happens. How, how? How do you how do you help them to approach those themes? You know, if if, if all of a sudden they've been drudging along, and not, you know whether it's the kid who's doing well or the kid's not doing well, he's maybe in the middle or he's in the last of all this. He's in the doldrums. What do you do to spike his or her interest? So our our teachers are masters of this, mm -hmm. and when they find uh, a child has really got a, an interest, um, they, they bring them additional support materials. They bring them other opportunities. They speak with their parents about, well, your child really looks um, to be very interested in this. We would suggest you go to the public library or go to a local museum, um, depending on what that interest is. So we're gonna leave that in the hands of our master teachers because they do a very good job of it. I guess the reason why I'm asking all these serious questions is to think back on, I think it's Josh's question, Josh saying about a difficult decision leaving the neighborhood school, neighborhood friends. How do you approach the kid or the parents and tell them, you know, you're not always going to be surrounded by these people, these friends. How do you, how do you help them to grow? If they want to, if they don't want to grow, because how many of us grow out of our own circle of friends? At what age do you suddenly evolve? Allegedly, I don't. I don't have that answer for you, Ron. I, I, I don't believe it's when they're ten or eleven, though. I think they're still, they're still very young at that age, and that, you know, I, I thought um, going, listening, and and our administrators as well that we're doing the right things to support the, the specialized needs of our students in the neighborhood schools because the parents have, in many cases, chosen to stay in those schools. I think it's going to be, um, it's going to be the parental decision on what they feel is in their child's best interest. And that may change over time, but that's who's going to be making those decisions. They'll know that they have the option, and then it's up to them whether they feel that their child, you know, would be a good fit for that. I mean, maybe this is redundant, but uh, somebody just emailed me and asked, uh, uh, and take, and they stated, 
and taking their specials away is not the answer. So someone needs accelerated learning and who likes the arts can't take part of it. So could you answer that with Melissa's question? Mm -hmm. oh, yes, in fact, if um, there would be art and music and math and science that will be embedded into these projects, it, it would not necessarily be the same art project that their classmates might be doing that week. Um, if there was someone who is um, advanced artistically uh, and they chose not to attend that 40 minute session, but went to the art class with their, their gen ed class, that would certainly be fine. So we, is, this project will be over a period of time and the students will have entry points into that. So and we did think that they would continue to, to take their physical education class, but they would have that option. And right now the administrators are, are looking at ways for this to be flexible in their buildings. And I, I think the opportunity too, that a decision that you might make to try something on like this, um, and knowing that gee, if it's not really a good fit for my child, they're not having to go back to a school. Um, they're still in their school and they're still with their, um, their teacher during the day and also with their classmates or their, their friends. So, so if it seem to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, so potentially, if um, this is a four times a week, a child could um, choose to do three times a week and then the fourth they could do their art or music. Or Correct, music. absolutely. Um, so there is some fluidity. So uh, maybe I'm oversimplifying it. That's what I try to do, take it all, kind of break it all down. So based on what you said, they'll be vetting these students through this process and they're going to come up with a list of recommended, recommended students that this might appeal to or they're going to um, invite students into the program. So mm -hmm. wouldn't it be, I guess, possible to send an invitation and have them come in so you can explain the program physically? Mm -hmm. Send them out. I mean, if I get another email, I think everyone's in the same boat at this particular point. I'm sifting through hundreds of emails to look for the important things that I should be looking for, like mm -hmm. state, federal things that you know important things, and then with everything else mixed in. And I find that you know most parents just so busy they just can't read everything that's in there. So it would seem to me your son or daughter has been invited into the program. We have a couple of sessions set up, and we'll explain all this because based on what I'm hearing, just from people emailing me, everybody has a different understanding of. AA or LEAP, and everybody's like, yes, no, everybody has a different understanding. So it would seem to me that if you're inviting them in, inviting them also in this you know, physical face to face form where you can explain the program so they fully understand what it is and then they can go from there. Yes, I think everybody you. has a different idea of what sure. LEAP has turned into. We get the talented LEAP. And one way to solve that is get everybody's attention, get them in the room. I think they'd be honored just the fact that their son or daughter. Is nominated to, you know, kind of is invited into the program, which, which would I think help to get their parents to a physical meeting. Sure, certainly. Thank you. Uh, just, I mean, just otherwise, we just keep. You know, if we want to support the program. I think, you know, we just said that, like the program and what people do, but it's changed, and so other people that maybe had an older child that was in it, it's different now. And maybe they heard it was different and they didn't take time to figure it all out. They could talk to people, the right people they should have talked to. It was just seemed to me that would, and, and it would probably increase the amount of students that are they want to be involved. Yes. How many do we anticipate per grade per school? A minimum of 20 students per grade per school. So that would be 40 students in each school for a total of um, 160 students. That's the math. Yeah, so I, I mean, I've heard the same thing from parents that, that Josh echoed around the neighborhood schools, the transportation, all those things. Um, that's definitely pretty consistent. Do we consider having one teacher per grade that just does full time learning with those students? Is that ever a consideration? We, we talked about a lot of things, uh, to be honest. Um, the, the idea that um, as the students not be isolated um, in, one, in that one class all day, every day for what would be two years and then maybe three more years in the middle school level um, was one of the, the concerns that we had heard. Um, this provides them the opportunity to 
to be an integral part of the entire grade level at their school, but then also have this um, advanced programming for them. Just because one thing I've heard just anecdotally from parents and you know people in the community is, is a struggle of these various levels or, or states of learning in the classroom where you've got you've got kids that are struggling, struggling. You've got kids that are at level and then you've got kids that are above. And the teacher in the classroom has to choose how to teach all three of these children at the same time. And I get the need to have these kids in the same class and, and work together, but I feel like, in my own opinion, just having uh, to work between three different sets of kids that are struggling, nobody gets the full extent of the help that they could potentially receive. Um, I, I have to politely disagree with that. Uh, okay. I, our teachers do a wonderful job with differentiating, and to be honest, it's more than three levels. So there are students who may have an IEP that are included in classrooms. There are students who may not have had the advantages at home because of poverty. They're at a different level. Some students who are on grade level in math, but maybe not in ELA. So I, I, while it is a very difficult thing that our teachers do as far as differentiation, there are a lot of small groups that they need to work with and they do their very best at it every single day. Believe it. Yes, I truly do. feel like that too. Um, I think there's a lot of research because in the olden days, kids are really segregated into different classrooms of learning ability, and they felt that that was not optimal way for all children to learn, and that's why we have you know, integrated, not homogeneous, you know, groupings, which is what they used to have. And the research does also show that people have different ways of thinking. And that if they're all together in a group and they share their different ways of thinking, students who may already be advanced are learning, wow, I hadn't thought of doing it that way. We see that all the time. I see it in math classes all the time where I have some students who are doing guess and check. I have other students who are in third grade and they have algebraic reasoning that they're doing. Um, other students who table or graph or visually do things and to have them all together and to represent their thinking really enriches all students. Sorry, I'm kind of on a soapbox. Okay. No, no, don't worry. Don't worry about that. Well, I mean, that just represents what you're saying is that more and more that we're going to see more and more technology and more, more and more the teacher's skills is, are going to have to be an understanding of all of those technology and where the student is because the measurement or the test will come from the software, will come from the technology, will you know, tell the student where they're at and the teacher. It's going to be a matter of the teacher being able to understand all of this, understand the technology, and understand where each student is at each grade level. I mean, that's a big difference in, in education, right? As we, but I'm not so sure it's the software that's going to help. But what happens I'm, if we're not going to, we're not, we're not going to, I, I just, I think we were talking about me. Now we're I know, I know you're talking about me. What happens if the kid decides, the kid, male or female, decides, you know what? I'm going to flunk it just to see how they, how yeah. they behave. How do you, how? Our students, yeah. they, you our students to want to do well, test. and they want to show that they can do well. Try it out. Let me know how you make it out. Go ahead, laugh at me. I am. I'm laughing. Let me know how you make it out. Fill in all the wrong boxes. Yeah. Can I just ask one last question? Yeah, we're going to move on. Why did we change the name, the acronym of the program? It used to be Lemons for Educational Acceleration Program. So we do. We do want to move away from um, calling this a gifted and talented program. Gifted and talented would mean somewhere between one to two percent of the population. Um, we've always kind of thrown a broader net than that. And so we really wanted to have an acronym that people could hold on to. Academically advanced is where we landed. We looked at a number of them, but this does, we think, take into um, give us a good definition, excuse me, for um, the students that would be part of this program. Okay, thank you. Yes. Good job. I have thank my you. matching with us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lorraine. Yes. Thanks, Lorraine. Everyone had a chance to review the minutes yeah. from May 17th. Anybody have a recommendation to approve? Make a motion to approve. Okay. By Eileen, we have a second. 
I'll second. Mr. Ron is seconded. And if there are any questions or comments, errors, omissions, please follow everyone's name right. We say we're here. We're here. Okay. Here's a question. Uh, and I brought it up there, Chris. I think when we have a member who is attending remotely, like tonight, we have two members. I think we have to annotate that they're attending remotely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, on the way in, I was able to listen to the interview. And when we're finding this out, we're all our state committees and everything in, in different boards and commissions that, you know, this part of you know, the bad part of COVID, but the right. good part is we're able to do a whole lot more of this and then there's much more participation. Yeah. Um, much um, Steve done a great job of the technology here. This is amazing. The only thing I'd like to know, Steve, and this is not, this is like not a fun burner, is that when I'm watching some of the meetings later, it's actually doing the whole closed caption on some of the meetings. Oh. That I've seen. Can we do those in other language? Can't somebody who speaks Portuguese hit a translation button? And I'm not suggesting know the answer now, but it would seem to me that this technology works so well. And we talk about how to get parents more involved in the community. And I know that for a fact, you know, based on everything I've heard, that people like this format where they can actually call in from home if they have something and, and do public participation at home. And it works well. I mean, the quality is really good. We hooked it up. But so I haven't seen the live transcribing um, computer based. Yep. Um, the research I've done and I'll re look at it has been you need an individual to, to translate the meeting in real time. So we might be on to something. We might make some money. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a bunch of students that could do this. I know it. I mean, could make money off. Sign me up. See, now we get investors. I'm not yes. sure. This is crowd sharing. I'm not sure I want that. I, I just may want to vote. Um, but anyway, it would be really nice because it works so well that, you know, if somebody's not feeling well, the dragon souls are here. We did look into it in the fall. Yeah, whatever you want. Know, but uh, we'll, we, we look at it. What's that? Dragon software. Yeah, yeah. It's. It seems to me that it's almost every, I've seen it in other places, I'll have to try to get it for you, but wouldn't it be wonderful if people just could, could click on another language that's more familiar with them, and, you know, watch the meetings and uh, just, just to talk. Okay. Yes, we do. All in favor. Those, and how are we doing out there in uh, Brandon? Brandon? World? Yes. Yes. And Greg. Yes. Okay. An unanimous decision. We now move on to finance update. We have a finance report. Melanie. Melanie. Uh, I'm here. I'm alive. <laughs> COVID has struck me. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, but I'm I'm coming up. I'm I'm turning the corner and I'm doing much better. So. Appreciate um, your dedication and work ethic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I think I'm good. Um, we are coming into the, the end of the year. So of course we're watching everything pretty closely. Um, I did not request to do any transfers uh, from last week because I was uh, would have been doing them from my bed with 102 fevers. So I'm gonna save those for the last meeting, um, which I believe is the 21st of June. Yes. Yes. Um, but at this time, I do not see a need um, to transfer anything between salaries and wages and expenses or expenses to salary and wages. I believe that we're in a great position to end the year without having to do that. So we're not going to have any transfers? We will have transfers within lines, within expenses. Um, but I will not be transferring between our buckets, so to speak, um, expenses and salaries. So... If you know what those are, could you get them to us sooner or later? Because that would be our last meeting. Yes. Yeah. Might be. So if you get that to us, whenever you know what they are, get them to us so we can look at them so we can show yeah. up. And sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm working on those. Um, I've started working on those this week. So I should have them before, before the end of, of this week. All right. So any questions for Melanie so she can get back to recuperating? <laughs> Feel better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Molly. Thank you. All right. Cool. The warrants. Do we have any warrants? We do. Brandon, do you want to read those? Because you love reading those. Sure. 
I'll make a motion to approve the following warrants from grants and revolving. You've got warrant 46 that totals $88,223.04. Warrant 47 that totals $484,076.41. And warrant 48 that totals $334.83.73. Uh, $334 uh, we also have warrant 46 totaling $902,226.16. Warrant 47 totaling $2,391,776.17. And warrant 48 totaling $400,242.67. Second. Uh, Mr. Chairman. that 
the superintendent's purview and we do the appointment. We have the ability to disapprove the appointment um, with an explanation of the disapproval, but we're not the ones hiring and firing. That's a position that the superintendent. You're correct. You're correct. So but a policy that, that says, a policy that says the superintendent or whoever it is has to advertise. It's not taking your ability to make a recommendation. It's just saying you've got to advertise. We're not superseding anything. It's it, the law is the law. We're just saying you've got to advertise. I, I, you know, just to be fair to everybody, you can't do let's advertise for this, but not advertise for that, you know, because we're backed up by the law. You advertise everything. I don't care what it is. Every position in the city, we advertise. Ever. I guess where I was coming from with this is opposite, but I was saying similar to what you were saying, which is like we should make it a policy across the board, not just with that position. If you want to get in trouble? We were under a consent order for many, many years. You want to get in trouble? You can get another federal consent order. Keep you know, keep that practice up where, where we get to a public meeting. And do we advertise for any position? Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. Do we or don't we? That's what I want to know. Do we advertise for any position? Because if that's the case, I'm fine. But if somebody can't give me a a a conclusive. We don't think that we advertise subject. for this position. We do advertise when we're and you know hiring that. teachers and when we're hiring other positions within the school system. But those are right. not appealing positions. I have a business. I can choose to advertise or not. This is a public process. This is taxpayer funded. And my feeling is we operate in a so, 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 which, so what I'm wondering is because I've been on the committee with you for many years and we've had many different superintendents assistant superintendents um not always consistently but you have never brought this up yes any no, you're other incorrect ways. i have brought it up and we I were at one that. point advertising everything everything was put out there we had the same thing on the city side as we did on the school side it's just fair and again yeah, i know i know i interview people all the time and sometimes people who just want to go through the interview process because they want to see what it's like because they might be interested down the road, they're taking courses, whatever it is, trying to be comfortable and let you find another community, a transfer, whatever it might be. And sometimes they just like to be considered. It's it's a morale boost to be considered for any position sometimes or for promotion. So I'm one vote, which you want. Yep, I'm sure. From the last meeting, was it mentioned? I believe it was superintendent speaking that the school doesn't have a policy that posts to all positions. Term school policy or the policy that we set. I don't know what we ask. That's what I thought the subject was. I don't know if they may have misinterpreted what mine. I, I can go and look and look at our policies and see if they state that we need to exercise all positions. I don't know off the top of my head. If we don't, I can pull some from other districts that do and we can look at those. Right. This, what we looked at was specifically. For the assistant superintendent, not the no, no, I get so, so I may not have explained myself correctly, right. but do you understand what it means to be an equal opportunity employer? Yes. Equal I can, I can opportunity do. employer. So I would be willing to bring before the school committee a policy that stresses that all positions are posted as part of equal opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, and that I think takes care of the, yes. the whole thing. It doesn't I don't require think we fall a specific policy. Or assistant superintendent, it's right. all positions. Right. Right. Or anybody that works for the school department, right. anybody right. that is funded must abide by these these policies. Right. That's all. That covers everything, whether it's a law or not. What the you know Mass Association of School Committee says, so attendance. Moving guessing. forward, I'm willing to break this before. Okay. The so the Chris meeting. is a brief pulling it out, get us a copy, and then just bring it up next time. It's not. It's not the end all. Okay. okay. Thank and are you talking about um, internal postings or external or both? Uh, that's what you'll have to bring up. I mean, I think you ought to put it out there. Well, I'm not seeing what you're I, 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 I think you ought to put it out to everyone, the whole world, if that's possible. And if that's a website, social media, wherever there might be somebody, right? Yeah, just so we're doing it all the time. I mean, before we can pass an ordinance, we have to publicly post the ordinance like three times in the no local newspaper before we can change the ordinance. I forgot that this is a little different, but we can re revisit it and Chris will look to see what we have underneath. Okay, let's move on to action items. So, so the acceptance. other policies that we were talking about, um, we do need 
going to have um it's not on the agenda to uh, right oh okay I'm to sorry. take yes. a um vote but if people wanted to do it under new world business we could totally vote. up to you if you get a, a, um, you get a motion in a second then it's to be voted okay because we'll need two votes in this way we can make sure it gets done this year all right um, so we have the harassment of students by um, file JICA. We have the non discrimination policy, including harassment and retaliation, file AC. We have um, sexual harassment policy, ACAD. So we have um, approved all three of those policies in the subcommittee, and this would be um, first reading. Everybody okay with that? So she's making a recommendation. If there's a second, then we get a vote. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. And questions? Everybody okay with it? The living, yeah. living document? No. I, I, I just yes, didn't know yes. if we're okay. We, we always right now. can review it. Yes. And it was, um, so there were some updates kind of legally that we needed to incorporate into our. All right. Just motion a second. All in favor? Those opposed? Mr. Brandon? Yes. Yes. And look at that. I'm harmonious. I'm stereo. So that was great. Be on the agenda for second reading. Thank you. Now, action items, acceptance of gift. There are two gifts this evening, one from AI, AIS Manufacturing for $53,096 uh, for furniture for our life skills classroom, and a second donation from Keefe Technical School for $41,790, both made out to CTI. Okay, so we have a motion. Make a motion to accept the gift. Awesome. All right, we have a motion second. All in favor? Thank you. Yes. And uh, yes. thank you. Thank you. Chris, uh, are we sending the thank you letter from the school committee? To yes. That? We do. Yes. Okay. All right. Vote on change in calendar. Yes, we had to move out the return date after New Year's Eve. So the first day after New Year's Eve will now be January 3rd instead of the 2nd. Okay. Motion. So that was my thought. When I initially did the calendar, I saw that January 2nd was not a holiday. It was January 1st, so I thought no problem. But Sunday. many contracts have it the first is only Sunday. Right. We, we have to have the second. Okay. Yeah. So then I had to move. Other than the fact forward. that you're planning our life a year ahead, yeah. Yeah. not a problem. Right. At least the it's helpful that we'll be here. I was just excited. I looked at the oh, January 2nd, it's not a holiday. Yeah, isn't that exciting? Because usually I have to wait another week, six to seven. Okay, a motion and a second, please. Motion and a second. All right. All in favor? Those opposed? Yes. Great. Yes, yes. All right, yes and yes. Approval of the MSBA Building Committee. Yes, this form needs to be submitted um, as soon as possible. These are committee members that between the school department and the city have selected for our first round. We need to submit this as soon as possible. Um, please check because I see several of your names on there. Um, and so we need a motion to accept. I'll make a motion to accept this and proceed with the record. Great new years. Uh, and, uh, I haven't seconded yet, so I'll second. You feel you know, I'll first you feel important. I, I feel like it may jump together. I just have one question. Yes. I see Steve as still director of technology on this. Is he still gonna do this role? Is somebody gonna take over for him? Um at this so at this time he's still going to manage the technology piece for us. Okay. So this is the first round of committees. Thank you. All right, the motion is second. All in favor, simplify the usual manner. Yes. Brandon and Greg show. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We're moving out to obsolete equipment. We're still cleaning up. So we're asking for a motion to uh, let us dispose of this equipment. Okay. Been hiding these things. Yeah. <laughs> Every time we open a closet, we find more. Yeah, your telephone. I love it. <laughs> Do you want one? No, I'm good. Okay. Do we have a motion? Motion. Declare surplus. Thank you. A second. Thanks. All in favor? Those opposed? Yes. And yes. Thank you. Um, vote on assistant superintendent salary. 
I'm asking for a motion to approve a three-year contract for Stephen Mamoni, salary set at 145 to begin on July 1, 2022. I'll second it. Questions, comments? <laughs> it's okay. I'm not going to get text. 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 Personnel circuit, I know, but I'd like to say it. I'd like that. Pupil personnel circuit. Was it, oh, there was only another P in it. Pupil service. Professional pupil personnel services director. That won't even fit on that. You'll have to carry one of those on. <laughs> Prefer it. Ah. <coughs> You'd be like flavor, flavor. You think setting up the clock, you'll have that with your name plate on there. Director of. Uh, new or old business? Do we have anything on the new and old business? So, um, yeah, Christy, you usually have to um, sort of commit um, whether we're attending the um, conference in November um, so that you can do the early oh, yeah. um, registration and get us cheap prices. Do you want me to, if I send an email to you, yeah. just reply to whether you want to come and give an answer? Yeah, yeah. 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 that'd be great. I just would strongly urge anybody to go. Um, it's um, a lot of good uh, learning and uh, lots, of, lots of workshops that are available. Graduation was awesome. It was excellent. Um, can't say enough about it. Students were great. It was really a nice day. I think the entire, it's the first time I think I can ever remember the entire school committee showed up. And thank you. The awards, I mean, just priceless. The, Thank you to all those that helped for years and years. People continue to fund those, you know, scholarships, and and that's that's a wonderful thing. I was going to ask you about the translation. I'll see if I can find something too, and ask our IT people uh, between the two. Maybe we can find something. And then, um, and then the other thing is, we just updated our website for the school department. I mean, we're pretty updated. I, I think over the summer. If everybody can write a little bio about yourself so we can put a picture of everybody up there. I mean, let's face it, this is a different world today. People find information, but especially newer people that are coming into the community and they want to know who their school committee is. And then you want to put who you are, what you do, you know, what some of your interests. I know what some of everybody's interest here is. A, bringing up a family, right? But other people have some really unique interests that are really cool. Tell a little bit about yourself and then maybe we can get up and you know, sometime in late August, we can get that up there so people know who you are, get a quick picture of you. And, um, and and then I think it would be helpful for us. I know the superintendent does that newsletter every week. And we put out a newsletter for the city. I think it would be maybe four times a year or as many times as you'd like. It, we have a, an attachment to that. And it's basically, you know, message from your school committee talking about what our goals are, what things we're working on. Just another way to communicate. We can't just communicate through meetings here. And assume that everybody watches this or goes home on a Tuesday night for the rerun, you know, with all the popcorn and watches this. Because everybody communicates differently these days. And I think that's important. And the other thing is, superintendent, if if it's all possible and, and if we have funds through the summer, some of the buildings need care on the outside. I think they're doing a great job on the inside. But just coming up here for the awards the other night, yeah, trash all over the place. And it's embarrassing because people are bringing People from the outside, and yeah, I know. I listen. I'm not 100% literate, free in my world, but it's just you know that's our image, right? Our, our first, you know, the first look of our buildings is the you know, is the outside of the buildings when they arrive, and so it's all possible. I know it's hard to find help, and they're maybe limited, but anything that we can do, we care for them all. Care for them. They're not doing it, but I mean on an ongoing basis. I mean especially when you have an event. You know, I mean, obviously, you got 2,000 people in the building this day. You're going to have stuff happen, right? Stuff going to blow out or stupid dog things. But when we have an event like that, I mean, we should go you know, steam, you know? Yep. I'll talk to the director of facilities in the morning. Yeah, and he's doing a great job. It's not. Yep. It's, no, he's great. Construct. I mean, I was picking up the real bags. <clears throat> yep. So far, I mean, and there's, you know, that auditorium is filled that night. So that's all. Not meant to be. 
I just have a question, Paul. Did you get any information on the creative choices online payments yet? Uh, yeah, I sent you an email right afterwards. She is still in talks with the comptroller right now, but Mindy Marcello is trying very, very hard to get it done. And then, oh, I just had one last thing. And then I know everybody has that thick, thick policy book. And I think I get a nod when I ask anybody, do you need that thing? And I don't even get it. I'll see it, but I don't. So I think it's important when we start a new school year to communicate to everyone that why we're here, that this is a, a building and buildings of learning, that we will do everything. The people in the building will do everything. As Lion said before, these are hard workers. They are talented. They're gifted. They will do anything. But we, we can't. There are certain things we cannot tolerate. And I think we ought to go to the top five list of the top things. So it's very clear. So we as a school committee, superintendent, staff, parents, everyone communicate the things we absolutely won't tolerate. All the other things are in there for educational purposes and basically communicate into anything to help the students succeed. But there are things we won't tolerate. And I think that has to be absolutely explained and understood by everyone that this is a place where there's, yes, there's a social aspect of it, and that's a good thing. There's a whole lot going on in the building, but the things we can't and won't tolerate, simple as that. And I think we have to highlight those um, as most documents do. I just hear us approving more and more things, and I just want to move up there to agree on it. Anyway, that's just one of those. Okay, are we having an executive session tonight? Yes, we are. We will not be coming out. We know we will not. So that means we're kicking everybody out. I know you really <laughs> want to stay. And if you want to stay and pay me, I'll take some of the proceeds for that new software we're going to be trying to share with us. Motion to go into executive session under Chapter 39 um, to discuss contract negotiations and we will not be returning. And this is a vote, a uh, voice vote. We'll start with Brandon. Yay. Greg R. Thank you yeah, yeah. for coming. And we'll go with Mr. Ron. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. You sure? <laughs> I'll be a yes. 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 Okay. We are officially in executive.